What are some jobs professions that existed in history but don't exist now? Part Galaxy said for a while before modern refrigeration, ice delivery was pretty big profession that employed a lot of people. Ice harvesting was dangerous too. A small army of people would essentially walk on a frozen lake in the early morning and literally chop out blocks of ice, almost Minecraft style, and load them onto trucks to be delivered to homes and businesses. Granted, there's still ice delivery and such, but modern refrigeration did away with the whole risk life on a frozen lake aspect of it, not to mention the ability to just, you know, make ice in the freezer. The Ark of Stories said. I mean, that was the whole point wasn't it? It shows the journey of Kristoff the main character, who loses his job because of the ridiculous affairs of the royalty who include people who are basically just elemental demigods in his struggle to return things to normal in the stability of his life. Back to Box said. Organ pumpers. Until the organ blower came along, organs had to be pumped by hand. Clergy would send sextons and altar boys up to the loft to hand pump the organ for services. Today, the organ blower gets turned on with the push of a button and supplies ample wind for the reservoirs and pipes. Andromeda 321 said. Astronomer here. To expand on this, at the turn of the 20th century the Harvard computers were a group of exceptional women who were hired to basically catalog all the new photographic images of the sky taken by Harvard Observatory Malay astronomers. It was thought unseemly for women to stay up all night at the telescope, to look for new things but also catalog things like variable stars. The incredible thing was these women ended up really driving the transition for astronomy from a let's look at the sky and catalog stuff and interdiscipline to a let's figure out the physics that drives the universe one along the way they discovered. How the hydrogen spectral lines change for different types of stars, paving the way for stellar classification. That binary stars exist where the two stars are so close to each other you can't split the two by eye, the majority of such stars today. Cepheid variables, which were the first independent way to calculate distance, late used by Hubble to discover the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, and that our universe was bigger than just our own Milky Way as people had assumed. Andromeda 321 said. So many new nebulae, galaxies, stars, etc. My personal favorite however is a supernova, SN 1895b, discovered in 1985 by computer William Inna Fleming. Mainly because during my PhD thesis I relied on her discovery to take late time observations of this object a century later and make constraints on the original explosion good science never dies. Colon. William Inna Fleming BTW was a single mom immigrant who was the maid of the observatory director at the time who was famously frustrated by the work of his Malig graduate students and famously complained my maid could do better. And hired her as a computer. She then ended up running the group, and had a correspondence and friendship with Andrew Carnegie's wife, the richest man in the world at the time. Oh, also as an aside, two of the computers who made some of these amazing discoveries possible were also deaf. Fun fact. I'm now postdoc in the very same institute and my office is just a few hundred feet from where the computers worked. My favorite detail is their building is filled with giant glass windows we think we are hot shots today, but back then there was no electricity so you'd pour over the images only during daylight. Sorry to go on about this I just think the computers are amazing and deserve to be known more than they are. MSF Ninja said. Rome was a social place, full of well-to-do people. So many people. In fact, that you couldn't possibly remember all of their names. Thankfully, you could avoid an embarrassing incident by bringing a nomenclator. With your trusty nomenclator by your side, anyone who comes within 5 feet of you or makes eye contact will have their name loudly announced so you can't possibly forget. Dent Miller Bots Hat said. Yeah. My grandfather operated one of these things for 40 years. My granddad, worked in a nice building, he got good tips. He'd walk home every night, roll of one stuffed in his lunch bag. He'd say hi, people would say hi back. Time went on, neighborhood got rougher. He'd say hi, they'd say, keep on steppin'. Granddad got to grip in that lunch bag a little tighter. Miss Sarah 101 said. My parents, who were boomers, explained that one of them had thought of getting a job as a soda jerk. It was like a bartender but with non-alcoholic carbonated drinks. Sometimes called dry bars. Milkshakes and frappe were also served. Here in New England, 
Milkshakes don't contain ice cream. Get your mind out of the gutter, jerk comes from operating the facets. When the soda fountain improved and allowed the option of multi-drinks or even self-serve, the job of a soda jerk become a novelty. I have only seen such a bar often attending stadium events. Max wife said. My grandmother was a corseteer. A corseteer was a specialist in women's undergarments back in the day when women's undergarments were much more utilitarian. She worked in a nice department store measuring women and helping them select garters, corsets, girdles, bras and stockings. This was in the 1950s to 1960s and while we do still have ladies who work in the lingerie section of certain stores, none of them are as specialized as corsetiers. And my grandmother tell you that, like she told us the same thing almost every time we went shopping for all of her 96 years of life. Cedar Wolf said. There was a deleted comment here about Victoria's Secret and the way they measure bras. Since I can't reply to that comment anymore, I'm going to share it here. I irk, the Victoria's Secret uses their own measuring ribbons, which aren't quite one, one to their true measurements, and run a little small. Furthermore, they're made of a fabric ribbon instead of a flexible plastic strip. While the fabric ribbon feels better against a person, they don't provide a true measurement because they stretch out a little bit over time. Which, ironically, may actually make the ribbon more accurate over time. It helps versus sell more bras by making people feel like their bust is larger in a versus bra or that they need to replace their other bras to match their true size which has been professionally measured by a fitting specialist. Loki said. I write historical fiction so I've come across quite a few of these. Some that haven't been mentioned yet. Lectors. Pre-radio some workplaces had a lector who would read out newspaper articles, books, or just tell stories to entertain manual workers. Sea sponge harvesters. Weighing themselves down, these people would dive up to 30 feet down, without breathing apparatus, to harvest sea sponges. Sea sponges had a range of uses, two of the less well-known are one, encased in a fine net and tied with a string, ladies use these during their monthly courses, or periods. They're so absorbent that some escorts still use them so they don't have to take one week off per month too, dipped in a range of substances such as vinegar, oil, or special tinctures, they were used in a similar fashion but as a form of birth control. The substances they were dipped in were thought to be spermicides but it's likely they worked only as a barrier method. Aircraft listener. Pre-radar they made sort of gigantic ear trumpets, like hard of hearing people used to help them hear before hearing aids and actual people sat and listened for sounds of approaching aircraft so they could sound an early warning. Loki said. Resurrectionists. As medical science progressed, access to bodies to study anatomy did not. People did not want to be dissected after death and no one left their body to science. Doctors were given the bodies of hanged criminals to study, but this generally was not enough. Indeed when half-hanged Ewan MacDonald awoke on the dissectionist's table, a young doctor bludgeoned him to death because he feared losing his chance to dissect a real human. I guess first do no harm doesn't apply if you really really want to cut someone up. Anyway, resurrectionists dug up the recently buried and sold the bodies to doctors and medical schools. Legally no one owned dead bodies, so it wasn't against the law. Many went to great lengths to ensure they could not be dug up, such as being buried under cement or stone slabs, or encased in iron cages known as mort safes. Some resurrectionists, of course, took it too far and began killing people, the most famous case being Burke and Hare. The profession, if it can be called that, slowly died out when doctors were given access to first, the bodies of paupers who couldn't afford a funeral, but the real death knell was when workhouses became a thing and doctors were allowed to dissect their dead. Merlin Otter Bear Clown said. Surprise this hasn't been mentioned yet, but scribes. Before the printing press, if you wanted a book, you had to have it made by a scribe. So some dude would have to spend hundreds of hours meticulously copying a book in minute detail in order for you to have a copy. So back then being able to read was basically the status symbol equivalent of owning a yacht private jet today. Or just being a priest. Flammabroil Ledhunter said. I think door-to-door -door sales in general. Ugh, I wish. I still get salespeople harassing my dogs on a weekly basis. They aren't even respectable anymore. Last week I had a guy knock like 20 times, rude, and just mashed the doorbell multiple times, I don't know how many because the poor bell got confused. 
I answered the door and asked why he did that when I clearly have a sign saying no solicitors. Oh I'm not selling anything I just wanted to see if you'd be interested in. Yeah, if the first thing out of tour mouth is a self-contradictory lie. You're gonna have a bad time. Another time a sales caller was simply high or strung out. He stared at me for a few seconds so I just closed the door. Prick knocks again, cop knock style. I opened the door and stare at him. After he finally gets a sentence out I said, You've had two chances now and you haven't even told me your name much less what you're selling. I've already denied you, now you're trespassing. Fuck around and find out. Met with their signature blank stare. I watched the ring camera and he stood there a good five minutes before snapping out of whatever he was on and moving on. PM your smiling face said. My mom used to love to tell the story of a particular door-to-door -door salesman who came to our house when four of us were infected with mumps, and my older brother was coming down with something else. We were all whiny because we were sick and we each were complaining that the others were getting more attention. My mom made a nurse's hat out of paper towel and bobby pins and said, Okay, I'm the nurse, and you each have to wait your turn as I make my rounds. Then came the knock at the door, and when mom opened it, Mr. Salesman who doesn't take no for an answer stuck his foot in the doorway to keep mom from closing the door. Mom, absolutely exhausted, and maybe a little delirious, and wearing a homemade paper hat, opens the door wide and says, Oh, come right in. I've got four kids with mumps and a fifth one that has come down with something I haven't identified yet. Make yourself at home. The salesman did an about face and ran away from her house, giving my mom the first good laugh she'd had in weeks. Still in Zainab box said. I had one of those about a month or so ago. I was in the bathroom when I heard a knock at the door. I'm not expecting anyone so too bad. I've got more important matters at hand. A minute or so later there is another knock. Another minute passes and more knocking. I quickly finished up and headed for the door as there was some still knocking. I'm irritated. I have to work in a bit and whoever is on the other side of the door is cutting into my already naturally low sleep time. As I swing open the door I can already tell the dude is selling something. I glare at him and tell him it had better be a fucking emergency since he woke me up and I have to work tonight. Guy just launches into his sales pitch. I cut him off with a no thanks and close the door. I hear a quick rapping, for fuck's sake, I throw the door open again and calmly tell him that I'm going to kindly need him in whatever company that sent him to fuck right on off now. He tried his pitch again and I took a moment to explain that with his constant disturbance it has ensured that not only will I not buy anything from him but I'll never purchase anything from the company either and I'll be sure to contact the company's customer service and tell them by name the reason why I refuse to buy anything from them ever. Dude called me a fucking bitch and walked off, not sure he even realized that he never gave me his name or the company he worked for. Pretty sure I could google who was selling insurance in my area but honestly I don't care as long as they don't come back. Baltic Romance Amaya said. In Japan, there are quite a few functions that aren't really necessary, but still have staff, like a dude pressing the buttons in elevators in high-end department stores or old dude standing around road maintenance work with fluorescent sticks, ostensibly directing traffic away from the maintenance work. Only there aren't really any cars on the road anyway and you can clearly see that half the road is blocked. I quite like it, though. I got to kind of know this old fluorescent stick guy I'd always pass every morning. PM your smiling face said. Key punch operators. In the old days of mainframe computers, new data was entered, somehow, by punching holes in little cards that would be fed into a slot in a computer. The job was becoming extinct around the time I was finishing high school, so I don't understand how punching holes in cards conveyed information to computers. But I do remember seeing classified ads in the newspaper advertising positions for key punch operators. Kiriko32 said. Garden Hermit. During Victorian times it was fashionable to have a hermit living in your garden. They were meant to dress in robes and hang out. Sometimes they would tell stories or history to visitors, but part of being a hermit if not hanging out around people, so, for the most part, they just existed. HTTPS colon slash slash www.atlasobscura.com slash articles slash the dash history dash of dash hermits dash in dash gardens resurrection men aka body snatchers stole bodies of the recently dead and sold them to medical colleges so that students could learn anatomy 
Families trying to prevent such fate of their dead family members would guard their kin's grave tomb or hire someone to do that, also a job that I would guess is no longer around, guarding the grave of the dead until they are too rotten to be stolen. HTTPS colon, slash slash, dot com, slash humanities, slash resurrectionists dash body dash snatching dash in dash one nine th dash century dash Britain. Velvet Dreamers said. Night Soil Man is a repulsive, undignified obsolete profession of her, entering the communal cesspit and collecting the accumulation of human excrements before the advent of modern sewage systems. The primitive privies were crude hunts to preserve modesty and a hole that was frequented by entire streaks of people. Unscrupulous landlords are an immutable attribute of Britain's accommodations and they always permitted amenities to become dilapidated due to extortionate costs of maintenance. Knights oil men often deigned to enter inundated cesspits to extricate the grotesque blockages and impede the transmission of cholera. I cannot fathom how malodorous it was. Catastrophic Headache said. Rough translation with a few liberties taken for clarity. Toilets in the old days were cesspits with roughly built huts over them to give people privacy. The whole neighborhood would use the same outhouses or cesspits. Bad landlords, who were an unchanging feature in Britain. Let the cesspits become run down because they were cheap as fuck and maintenance was pricey. Knights oil men were sort or like plumbers and sometimes they would be called upon to clear out nasty blockages in cesspits in order to stop the spread of cholera. I cannot imagine how stinky it was. Artsy Heather said. Not nibblers they were hired to chase dogs out of churches. Wonder why they didn't just shut the church doors. Knocker-ups they were hired to knock on people's windows or shoot peas at the windows to wake them up. Basically an early form of personal alarm clock. You also used to have poor who would pee in a pot and sell it to tanneries to dial others. I was reading about it somewhere and it's a myth that that's where the saying piss poor comes from. It doesn't as that saying only came about in the 1940s. Wex52 said. Professional readers, called lectors in Spanish. Pre-radio. Factories used to employ people to read news and literature to their employees. The reason I include the Spanish word for it is because I read about them in a book called The Jews of Key West, where the profession was described as a cigar factory staple in Cuba that migrated to the factories in Key West. I will say that I'm hard-pressed to believe that this idea started in Cuba, but it's the only time I've heard about it. Formal Mango said. Bullocky. My great-grandpa was a bullocky. He drove a team of bullocks, hauling timber from the mountains down to the railhead. He was also a traveling Baptist preacher. And, apparently, sometime faith healer, and water diviner. And he claimed he could find a gold seam with a sheep's leg bone and a piece of string dipped in vinegar. Also, my husband was trained as a film projectionist. Quasi Moron One said. A computer used to refer to someone who does mathematical calculations. The repetitive kind normally, for work, such as would be required in any business's financial department. They are a person who computes hence the job title computer. Of course now the heavy repetitive calculations are done by machines so the job has become obsolete. Illustrious Fall 224 said. There are still blacksmiths, albeit not common there are still occupational blacksmiths. Old steel working town I lived in for a time there was a guy down the street who used his skills to produce iron parts on commission for iron works, producing horseshoes for local farms and horse breeders. He even took a few apprentices. Not sure about this one but I imagine they belong to a trade guild or association for network and training. Swimming site 7682 said. Castrobus, were classical Malay singers, equivalent to sopranos, mezzo-sopranos etc., who were castrated before reaching puberty, therefore when they sing as adults they will continue to have that high pitch tone that they had when they were boys. The practice was purposely diminished by the late 1800s. You could find a recording of one castrato named Alessandro Moreschi on YouTube. Victus Vesperlilio said. Rush Burr. In the Middle Ages, many churches and castles had bare earth or stone floors. It was the practice to weave mats of sweet flag mistakenly called rushes, which were layered onto the floor to warm the floor, cushion it, hold down unpleasant odors, prevent people from walking through all kinds of hacked up nastiness, it was the custom to spit on the floor, and prevent insects from crawling up onto people's clothing. The people who brought the rushes in and laid them were the rush bearers. 
Matches 67 said. I heard in the 1800s alcoholism was so rampant they used to hire people to take horse-drawn wagons through the streets in the early morning to round up passed out drunks and toss them in the wagon. This had to be done because sometimes there was so many of them they would block the streets. The wagons would take the drunks back to their own neighborhoods or someplace out of the way. I saw in one documentary that explained what inspired prohibition that these wagons drivers would just toss the drunks into a river to wake them up and send them on their way.